Shalom, my name is Joseph Shulam, and we're continuing recording the teachings from the Torah portions that are read in every synagogue next Shabbat. The Torah portion that we're going to be talking about today is probably one of the most interesting and more challenging Torah portions in the whole five books of Moses. There are several of these challenging portions and dramatic portions like the giving of the law in Mount Sinai, chapter 20 of the book of Exodus. And now we are going to deal with Moses commanded by God to send men of renowned leaders in the camp to tour the country, to examine the country that God promised Abraham to give him as an everlasting possession. The portion starts in book of Numbers chapter 13 verse 1 and ends in the book of Numbers chapter 15 verse 41 and the Torah portion uh, is called Lech Lecha in Hebrew which means dispatch these men. Uh, The section from the prophets that is being read is from Joshua chapter 2 verse 1 to verse 24 And the section that we read from the New Testament is Hebrews chapter 3 from verse 7 to chapter 4, verse 13. And of course, I recommend all of you to read as much as you can of these texts because that is the most important thing. The more important thing is the product than the salesman, which means that the preacher, the pastor, I, or any other teacher is less important than the product itself, and the product is the Word of God. What are we talking about? It starts with the words, and God commanded Moses, saying, Send to yourself men to tour the land, to examine the land, to scout the land, to traverse the land, whatever the translation you want of the Hebrew word latur. Uh, all these meanings catch. I repeat, to scout, to tour, to traverse, to examine, all these are in the word tour in Hebrew. And God tells him what kind of men he should choose for this mission. And the men that he is to choose are the presidents, the leaders of the tribes. There's 12 tribes and he should send 12 men and the men that are sent are supposed to be men of renowned, selected leaders of the tribes. And we have their names. From verse uh, 4 we have the names of the representative of the tribe of Reuben who's the oldest son of of, uh, Jacob. Yeah, and then tribe after tribe, we have the names of the people that are sent. Among them, of course, there is Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Yefune. And uh, they are supposed to be among 12 leaders. I am repeating this. If you want to understand stories, You have to understand the beginning of the story and the end of the story. Everything in between the beginning of the story and the end of the story is a filler. Important details, but it's a filler. The fact that the story starts with the men that are chosen to go on this mission to scout the land and they are the presidents of of the tribes of Israel, is very, very significant. In other words, Moses did not choose just anybody who wanted to go. He chose the best, the ones with the most talented gifts as presidents of the tribe. And that makes the story much more significant. And they're supposed to go 
examine the land, uh, peruse the land, scout the land, and bring back a report. Bring back a report, and in verse 18 of chapter 13, we are told what they're supposed to do. They, what are they supposed to, to bring? They will look at the land, what kind of land it is. They will look at the inhabitants of the land that live on the land. Are they strong or are they weak? Are there few or are there many? This is a strategic examination for somebody who's getting ready to wage war. He has to know who is his enemy, how much power his enemy has, how much man his enemy has, what kind of uh, training he has. In verse 19 of chapter 13, we read uh, what kind of land it is. Is it a good land? Is it a bad land? Are they living in fortified cities or in unfortified cities, in camps, in fortresses? This is all information that a good spy ought to bring back to the headquarters in order to be able to assess what is before them and what kind of force they need to conquer such a land. Is the land fruitful or not? Can it sustain such a large public as the children of Israel coming out of Egypt? Do they have fruit trees? Do they have uh, grapes? Of course, grapes were not only for eating, but for wine, which was important. And the men these 12 men get up and go in verse 21 of chapter 13 and they cross the desert of Tzin and they go all the way to the north, to Levo Hamat, which is today in, in Lebanon. They go from the Sinai desert all the way to the north of Israel, to the Lebanon, to Levo Hamat, and they tour the land, examine the land. They come through the Negev, and they stopped in Hebron, which is, was one of the major cities where Abraham bought uh, the tomb of Machpelah to bury Sarah, and then he himself was buried there, and then Isaac was buried there, and then Rebekah is buried there, and then Jacob is buried there, and Leah is buried there in that same cave of Machpelah that Abraham brought from Ephron the Hittite. And uh, they meet there, Achiman, Sheshai, and Ptalmi, that were descendants of the giants that were in Hebrew, Hebron. And uh, they give us a, a date that the city was built before the city of Tzohan in Egypt. And then they look at the, uh, at the agriculture, they find grapes, beautiful grapes. Uh, the, the, the grape bunch was so big that they had to carry two men on a pole, which is the, the symbol of uh, tourism in Israel. The Ministry of Tourism symbol is Two men carrying a, a huge grape bunch hanging on a, on a pole between the two men. They were so big, so heavy that two men had to carry it. And of course it, it tells us that they call the place Nachal uh, which means the, the river of the grape bunch that the children of Israel picked there in that place. And after 40 days of touring the land, they come back to Moses. Now, again, numbers in the Bible are typological. They're not only arithmetic. They're not only mathematical. 
but they're typological. Anything to do with the number of four. Four, 40, 400 is a sign of testing. Children of Israel, 40 years in the wilderness. They were tested these 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus, 40 days and nights in the wilderness. He was tested by the devil in these 40 days and 40 nights. And these 12 leaders of the tribes that were sent to examine the land, to tour the land, to scout the land, spent 40 days walking up and down the land, examining the fruitfulness, the fertility, what kind of vegetables, what kind of trees, what kind of fruit, what kind of cities, what kind of inhabitants were in the land. 40 days. It's not an accident that it's 40 days, folks. That's what I'm trying to tell you. The Torah is telling us this mission that Moses sent these 12 men, the presidents of the tribes, was a test. Not only to test the land, but to test the leadership of the tribes of Israel that were chosen men to go and do this scouting of the land. Verse 26 of chapter 13, they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole community of Israel that were at that time encamped in Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea, by the desert of Paran, which is west of Beersheba, straight into the Sinai Desert, uh, probably a several days' walk from Beersheba westward to Kadesh Barnea. And they bring with them their own impressions, their witness, and they also bring and show the fruit of the land that they gathered and they carried with them to bring it to show Moses and Aaron and the children of Israel how fruitful that land is. Their answer comes in verse 27 of chapter 13 and says, This is what we saw. You sent us to a land of milk and honey, and these are its fruit. The phrase, the land of milk and honey, appears several times in the law of Moses. Also in the book of Exodus, and also in the book of Numbers, and also in the book of Deuteronomy. It appears several times. It's a formula. And there is a big debate among scholars, what does it mean? Milk and honey. Are they talking about cow milk, goat milk, sheep milk? What kind of milk? And what does the honey mean? According to many of the scholars, they're talking about date honey. Silan in, in, in Hebrew and in Arabic. It's not bee honey that bees make in a beehive, but it is honey that comes from the dates. Processing the dates, and it's uh, very similar to bee honey, but different taste, different consistency, and different character. I don't know to tell you what it is. Some scholars say it is the date honey, and others say it is the bee honey. Uh, whatever it is, it's honey. That, that I can tell you for sure. A land of milk and honey. What is the thing about the land of milk and honey? And that is that men have nothing to do with the milk. They have to milk it out of the goat, out of the sheep, out of the cow, if they had cows. They had cows, we know, because they, the, in the sacrificial rites, they had bulls and cows as well, like heifers and, and, and uh, veal and beef. But they had also the land of milk and honey, which means there are two things that man has very little to do with them. Milk is produced by the animal from God. And honey, whether it's bee honey or date honey, is produced by the bees or by the dates themselves from the tree. 
It's not something that they had to till the land and, and feed the bees and, and, and or no, it's something that is independently provided in the land of Israel by the land and by God. We see this in Isaiah. In Isaiah, when it's talking about the land of Israel, and that is a land that is independently endowed by God. It's blessed by God, and, it, and, and the milk and the honey are produced by God, not by men. They don't manufacture it. The bees, if it's bee honey, the bees manufacture it. If it's date honey, the dates manufacture it. And the milk comes from the goats or the sheep or the, the, the beef. Yeah, which means that it's a land that is independently sustainable by its nature, by its nature. But they continue in verse 28 of chapter 13. But the people are strong. Well, the people are strong. They are settling the land in fortified cities, big fortified cities, very big fortified cities, and they are descendants of the giants that we have seen there. And Amalek, the, the perpetual enemy of Israel, is settled in the Negev desert. The Hittites and the Jebusites are in the mountains in the central mountain range, and the Canaanites are sitting in the Jordan Valley and on the seashore. You know, they're painting a, a picture of a complex situation in the land of Canaan. Nothing is simple. What they're saying is nothing is simple. And then Caleb bursts into the scene in verse 3 he says, Be quiet. Caleb says to the people and to Moses, We can go up and inherit that land and we can do it. Yachol nochalla. In other words, we, uh, we can do it. it can, it's d doable. For us Israelites that were a generation of slaves, our fathers and our grandfathers and our great grandfather were slaves in Egypt, but we are now free men and we can go and take the land. But the people that were with him, the other spies, the other tour uh, people, the people that scouted the land together with Caleb, said, oh, we can't do it. These people are much stronger than we are. And they brought out an evil report of the land as a result of their scouting the land. It's a land that devours its inhabitants. That's what they say in verse 32. A land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw there were big guys, strong guys. True. And we saw there the Nephilim, the sons of the giants. And we looked like grasshoppers next to them. And they looked at us and they thought we were grasshoppers. And they complained to Moses and to Aaron and the children of Israel and in front of all the leadership of the community that came out of Egypt into the desert. And they said, I, we wish we were dead. Yeah. They discouraged the people. They robbed the people from faith, from hope, from confidence, from self Assurance. 
And then they say in chapter 14, verse 3, why did God even bring us out of the Egypt? Did he bring us out to, so that we could die by the sword? Our women and our children will be devoured. They will be, uh, you know, de- ashamed, put to shame. It would have been better for us to stay in the land of Egypt. Now this is a very serious situation, folks. They have been going now for several years, several, I would say, decades. Maybe maybe a decade since they left Egypt. And they're at the edge of entering the land that God gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now they're saying, oh, we wish we had died in Egypt. Why did we even leave Egypt? You see, this is one of the big issues of what faith means. See, faith does not look only in the situation that is reality. Faith does not rely on our own strength. Faith relies on our track record of the past. Yeah. The lamp from the past is the path for our future. That was one of Ben-Gurion's mottos, the first prime minister of Israel. The light from the past is our path for the future. That's what the leadership of, of the ten tribes didn't have. They didn't calculate. We left Egypt. The sea was in front of us. The Egyptian army was behind us. Did we have a chance? No. But God took us through. We were in the wilderness. We didn't have water. We could have died from thirst. From drying up. God provided water from us. By striking Moses. Striking the rock. In chapter 17 I'm talking about. Not the second time. In the book of Numbers. God told him strike the rock. Water came out of the rock. They had The Amalekites attacked them. Did they have a chance? No. But Aaron and Hur held the hands of Moses up in the air. And the battle was won by God. All these events, they didn't take into account. They didn't take the, God's track record in taking care of his children. They looked at the reality and they allowed the reality to poison their faith. That was the big sin of these spies, of these scouts, of these men that were sent to examine the land, to scout the land. It was not the, the, the issue of, of the reality that was in the land of Canaan. It was the issue of the lack of reality of how they saw themselves with God as their leader, as their general, as their president, as their warrior that fought the battles for them and provided all their needs in spite of their complaining and their murmuring. That was the big sin of these 12 tribes. That's why only two people that left Egypt entered the land of Canaan, Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Yefune, from among the people that, that were sent by Moses, the presidents of the tribes, only these two had faith. And when they heard what the other ten spoke, what did they do? They, they used the customs of mourning for the dead. They tore their clothes in chapter 14, verse 6. 
And they said to the community, to the, to the crowd of the children of Israel, we have gone and, and scouted the land and the land is very good. You could say that it's hard. You could say that the people there are big and, and, and sons of giants. You could say that they live in fortified walled cities. All true. But the land is good and we can do it. It's a very good land and we can win it. How can we win it? Verse 8 of chapter 3. If God wants us, if God brought us to this land, if God gave us this land, the land of milk and honey, with God, we can do it. This is a lesson for all of us, folks. All of us sometimes in our life face, I would say, unsurmountable difficulties. And we don't know how we're going to get out of it. And we don't know where our salvation is going to come from. And we say, well, it's time to give up. I'm, I'm, we're giving up. I'm raising my hands. Lord, I can't do it. But Joshua and Caleb knew God. They were not only religious. All of them were religious. They were presidents of their tribes. But it's possible to be religious and not to have enough faith. And the ten spies, the ten leaders of the tribes, they knew the facts. The land is beautiful, there's fruit, grapes. Uh, it's a good land, the land of milk and honey. But what they didn't have, those ten, is that they didn't trust the boss. Our boss, the boss of the whole earth, the one that the, the whole earth is his footstool, the father and the creator of the world, the sun and the moon and the stars and everything in our galaxy, at least our galaxy, maybe more. That is the one that they didn't know. And without him, yes, it looked hopeless. It looked bad. It looked hopeless. But the people who knew God, and they looked at the backlog, they looked at what God has done for them in the past, they said, we can do it. Not alone. With God's help, we can do it. And I want to tell you this. We are commanded in the letter of James that whatever we decide to do to say, if God helps us, in Arabic, inshallah, in Hebrew, Beretzon Hashem, with God's will, and if you talk to Jew, Orthodox Jews or to Muslim Arabs, they are not going to commit to anything. They'll say, God willing. We're commanded to say, God willing. I hear people in Israel, Arabs and Jews, all the time say, God willing. Said, will you come to visit us next Friday? Come to our house as a guest. God willing, I will come. The Arab will say, Inshallah, I will come. But I don't hear Christians keep the command that the letter of James tells us. We don't say inshallah. Joshua and Caleb said with God's will we can do it. And they did it. We're going to talk about this next section of the book of Numbers and we are going to celebrate the punishment and the repentance of the children of Israel that equipped them later to enter, to cross the Jordan, to enter the land and to take it. Let's all take our land of Knaan with faith. In Yeshua's name, Amen.